being Mr. Lane Kesselman. Hi, my name is Lynn Kesselman. I'm a psychotherapist, an author, as Lady pointed out. I am a registered addiction specialist and I'm certified in chemical dependence. And I also hold a pending patent on a new school of psychotherapy, which I developed very specifically in connection with helping addicts. I'm also myself a person who had to take a gun out of my own mouth 10 years ago so I could be here with you today. I'm recovering from, I originally thought alcoholism, I've later discovered I was recovering from the bankruptcy of my spirit and under that a bankruptcy of faith that life and I would be okay. And so that's what created my bankruptcy of spirit. This morning, uh, I'd like to share with you a few of the concepts that underlie my special approach to addiction, understanding it, and treatment. Uh, more than my own story, my story is like so many people's stories. I was uh, uh, emotionally not really together young fellow, and that moved forward through my life as uh, I was able to be seemingly successful at different things professionally, but inside I was always empty. Ultimately, when I hit some really hard times in life, I became more and more dependent upon alcohol to get through the day. Eventually, I was always full of alcohol. And so finally, it didn't work anymore, I couldn't work anymore, and I didn't want to live anymore. I see addiction as basically uh, three panels. The first panel is the face with which, the spirit with which I deal with my world. Is my spiritual condition good? Do I have a sense of security that I can be and I can do what I need to be and do to have a secure and happy life compared to whatever my expectations are? And my expectations are a big piece of the secret to will I in fact have faith that I can be or do what I need to be or do to have a happy, secure life. The second panel is, and we hope we don't get there, if we don't have that belief, we're going to have a form of pain known as anxiety. Anxiety is when I don't believe I can be or do what I need to be or do. I'm scared. I'm empty inside. I have no faith. And therefore, I have no spiritual condition. Now, the question is, when I get to that place in life, what do I do? Okay. Two young fellows go off to college. They join the same fraternity. They attend the first fraternity party. They're from the same neighborhood. They seem to be from similar families. One of them gets to a point in the evening where he says, uh-oh, I better go up, take a shower, and do a little studying so I can be ready for something I have to do in the morning. A test, an assignment, whatever. Just get to class. The other one, he's unable to think about that. He's going to keep drinking and partying until eventually he can't do anything except collapse. Why are these two fellows different from each other? That's the secret to what's going on. Why are they different? Some will try to tell you it's heredity. Well, I've taken more than 300 people through uh, a childhood regression program I developed that effectively finds out where these disturbances began and starts to reverse them. That's the technology of the science of healing the spirit, which my book is about. And by the way, every single person here is welcome to a free copy of my new book, which explains how all this works. And it's at the back of the room. And if you want one, as you leave, or whenever it's convenient, just take one. There are more than enough for everybody. Okay, here I am, I'm in a state of anxiety. And one day, somebody puts a drink, a drug, something in my hand or in my system, and I say, wow, my anxiety has gone. Why? Because it changes the reality that I'm seeing. 
the reality. What do I think is going on? Who do I think I am? Can I give myself pleasure? Sure, just have some more of that, or have some more of that, or some more of that. And I'm powerful. I can change my reality. Now, who's going to give that up for feeling miserable and empty inside? Not an addict. <laughs> That's what addiction is. I don't want to give that feeling up because you know what? It's the only time I feel any good. Let's not condemn the addict. Let's find out what happened to him. And we'll get to that. So now the question is, what part of my being reaches for what when anxiety hits me hard? Well, the addicted part of me looks for whatever seemed to have worked last time. And I'm going to reach for that. And if there's none of that, I'm going to find another addict and see what the heck he's reaching for. Sometimes I like to say that the first drug we use in life is a lie. A lie to ourselves. Why? It works just like a drug. It's something artificial that we use to improve how we feel. A lie is a drug. A self-lie is a drug. Now, if I tell you a lie, but I don't believe it myself, that's more complicated. But if I start telling a lie till I believe it, no question about it, that's a drug. It changes what I see in a way that I need to change it so I feel okay. That's a drug. If it's artificial, if it's not based on joy and a sense of adequacy and a sense of accomplishment, a hopefulness toward the future, all those things that are part of great spiritual condition based upon a faith that things are going to be okay, I'm using drugs. Doesn't matter what the drug is. Could be sex, gambling, abuse of food, virtually anything, even work or working out conceivably. Okay. The second panel is what I reach for that defines my addiction. If I reach for alcohol, I'm an alcoholic. If I reach for heroin, I'm a heroin addict. If I reach for cocaine or crack or whatever, that's in the second panel. That's what I am used to reaching for when I'm not feeling okay. Now what's in the third panel? Well, the third panel is made up of how do I feel about myself after I've used and the consequences of realizing I've used said in. Now, this is very important for those of you who will be professionals or those of you who are in recovery and perhaps have relapsed a few times. Get out of that mindset of the white chip. Get out of the mindset of judgmentalness. Get out of the mindset, oh my God, my recovery's over. Get into the mindset of, well, I could never know how good my recovery was until it wasn't good enough. Anyway, it just isn't good enough yet. And so I have to not blame myself, but redirect myself. Because too many people, when they relapse, either go to environments or have been brainwashed in themselves to condemn themselves, which makes them feel still worse, which even lowers the chances they can stay clean and sober. Self-judgment, as I'll explain in a minute, is where the whole problem came from. And here I'm just making it worse. So if use is part of my experience again, I have to say I don't want to relapse just because I used. What I want to do is use it as part of my recovery, redirect myself, learn from it. Not give up the game, not condemn myself. And what I said about a white ship is nothing bad about a fellowship. What I'm saying is, let's not let our mind get there. The guy with six years since his last use may not be more well than the guy with four or one or even a half. We don't know. And it's irrelevant. I remember when I first started my recovery, I used to look at it as a competitive sport. I had a sponsor with 18 years. So I went to three meetings a day, seven days a week, and announced I was going to catch up to him because I was tripling or quadrupling my recovery time until I caught up to him. <laughs> That's the kind of mindset an addict has. <laughs> Thank God, you know, it, it kind of worked a bit. And so it's a good place to go, to a fellowship. I tried to work the 12-step program. I had a heck of a bad time with it. I found that it was cryptic. I, I couldn't follow the logic. I, I went up to old timers and I said, Psst, how does it work? And I always got this answer, just fine. <laughs> I 
couldn't believe it. That's all the guy could tell me. And then I tried an old timer at a different meeting and a different, they all said the same thing. I guess the word had gotten around. That's what you're supposed to say. But I promised if I understood ever how it worked, I'd write a book so the next guy like me who needs it in black and white and simple and understandable would have a little better chance of getting there. So I wrote my first book, Recover With Me. It's a 12-step recovery book. And then, seven years later, began the writing of this most recent book, Five Gates, The Science of Healing the Spirit, which is not so much just about addiction or recovery. It's about personal spiritual maintenance, ascension, and transformation. It's for anyone who wants to really feel great, improve their energy, improve their memory, improve their focus, become more capable of living in the present, sharply focused on the next right thing to do, with a spiritual wholeness that says, I'm going to be able to do that, or I'm going to accept that I did my best. That's what it's about for me. Five Gates, The Science of Healing the Spirit, the book that I've offered you copies of today, which every single person here is welcome to have, and even take one for a friend if you like. I brought a lot of them. Uh, I, I started a charitable foundation in 1996, and we've been very fortunate in that we've had some very fine gifts to give away books, materials, and have them come speak to schools and other uh, worthwhile places, and I'm really honored to be here today with you. And um, in, in our approach, you can actually take this book and take yourself through the five gates. Or you can get in touch with us. Our contact information is in the book. Think of it as a calling card as well. Possibly to schedule uh, private therapy to go through the gates with me or one of my assistants. I focus on the whole idea that my problems are in me and that my denial is all about seeing the problems as being out there in the world. It's in the bottle of alcohol, it's in the this, it's in the that, it's in the, it's in the principal, the teachers, the coach, the policeman who pulled me over, the landlord, the boss that fired me, or doesn't pay me, whatever. My problems are in me because they're the only things I can do anything about anyway. So what good does it do me to think they're somewhere else? Sure, I'm gonna meet a lot of challenges in life. But the ones I can actually solve are the ones that help me manage myself better. In AA, for example, is first step. I'm powerless over alcohol. Okay. I don't, I don't need to add anything to that observation. My life's... I can't manage it. It's unmanageable. There's the key. There's the solution. And I have to learn how to manage my life by learning how to manage me, by learning how to manage my spiritual condition. Just a few tips and pointers about this. Try to live a life of affirmations. Uh, a really great published mentor, I didn't know him personally, uh, Michael Franz Bosch, uh, wrote a book on psychotherapy in which he basically teaches that if we can just do something positive as often as we get a chance to do it, we'll never suffer from low self-esteem. Even the smallest positive thing. Hey, give a ride to somebody someplace, brush your own teeth, get dressed in the morning even on a day off, or just anything. Just something, do something, do something. Don't ruminate into the mind. Don't start living in your fears. Don't, don't start renting space to all the, the voices and the fears and the feelings that are negative. Because if you just do something positive as often as you can, something constructive for yourself or anyone, your low self-esteem will go into a temporary, state of suspension and if you make that way of life permanent and stay on that track our low self-esteem will leave us as permanently as that commitment brings us to keep enjoying the affirmations of positive actions and thoughts how do I get out of my negative ones? Well, let me tell you a little bit about how we got in that bad place to begin with. You know, that guy who couldn't stop drinking and couldn't stop partying and couldn't get up to bed and do any homework or show up the next morning who looked just like the first guy who did. He has something in his history. People who don't know how to get him well are very tempted to say, oh, well, his father had this problem, his uncle had this problem, he's a hereditary alcoholic, he's a hereditary addictive personality. Well, 
I don't think we have time here today for me to offer you all the logic that says I don't believe this. But it would be based on chemical evidence and my own practice and the fact that I have never ever regressed one of my patients through his early life who was an addict that I didn't find out exactly why in the course of hearing the story. The way he sees reality was passed on to him as a small child by his parents, by the world around him. His feelings of inadequacy were driving his anxieties. His anxieties were driving his cravings for relief. His cravings for relief were immediately satisfied by using something, whether it's lies, stealing, whatever it is in the beginning, and later drugs. The fact is this kid got set up by his core beliefs the things he started believing about himself and life at the very beginning. And if we want to treat drug addicts, we have to start, A, with ourselves living a life of positive affirmations, a life of not judging other people, a life of teaching our friends who are having problems not to judge themselves, and a life of raising our children with the faith that life is a positive experience and they can, in fact, do the only thing correctly that is their job in life. Keep learning how to do the next right thing. Keep trying their best to do it. Forgive and accept their limitations. They are not their shortcomings. We have to raise our children so they don't feel inadequate. We will have a heck of a lot less addicts to populate the next generation. What I do is I take people through and I use what is called the inverted pyramid effect in psychology to reverse this process of low self-esteem by going back to the root causes through buried memories that I dislodge. And when they're dislodged and they're open to the light of day, the sunlight of seeing with adult eyes what we couldn't handle with our child's eyes that we misinterpreted, the whole process amazingly reverses quickly and people you would never dream that look like they were dead, like they were vegetables, come back to life. People who've gone to 22 treatment centers, never stayed clean a month following you, suddenly don't have any cravings. This is the goal. We have to change the reality we see. We have to change how we feel about ourselves. We have to change our expectations from life and make them realistic and achievable. We have to forgive ourselves our limitations and not see them as our shortcomings. And we have to do the same for every other person living because we all are swimming around in the same fish tank with the same sharks that eat our spirit. That's enough for one, <laughs> for one presentation. But if anyone really wants to ask me any questions, uh, I don't know if that's the format of this program. Is it? Okay, anybody want to know anything? Okay, please, please help yourself generously to the books. I thank you for being a great audience here today. Uh, I look forward to seeing you again. God bless.